So we're the Underground Scholars. We're a formerly incarcerated student-led program here at UCSB. And so we're all formerly incarcerated students who've worked hard to get to our bachelor's degrees. Um, so this is actually our behind the wall art exhibit. Um, this is uh, actually one of, uh, the, one of the best tattoo artists. He did all my ink. Uh, Luis Martinez, they call it Chaparro. And uh, he actually does this on sheet. So it's sheet, bed sheet, and he uh, makes a homemade sewing needle and he sews up the bed sheet. And then he takes a pen and he sprays the ink out on paper and he folds up a piece of paper and he shades it all in with the ink on the paper. That's so crazy. This is and so, so yeah, and this is actually a piece from one of his uh, uh, students that he's teaching and uplifting. Exactly. Yeah, there's stickers and pins too, yeah. I mean, we just got to all come together as a community and, you know, and just recognize like, you know, like it's about us being together as one and uplifting each other instead of dehumanizing and throwing each other away, you know? Like all this is human capital that's being wasted. You know what I'm saying? It's all human capital, you know? So and it's being thrown away, you know? So we'll get there though. We're here today at the Real Loud Film Festival uh, for Underground Scholars. Um, it's actually part of um, UCSB, uh, but the Underground Scholars are here to represent um, Ryan, my, my, my other half, my partner's uh, video for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Actually, it's prison traumatic stress disorder. He did his little twist to it. Um, so we're here just uh, representing formerly incarcerated students. Um, helping them transition from uh, jail to college or from prison to a university. Prison traumatic stress disorder. After serving my time in segregated housing unit, one day they cuffed me up and said I was going back to the main line. They transferred me to a level four maximum security prison called Salinas Valley, better known as the death of Octagon, as so many inmates die or are killed there. I learned quickly, this is a vicious place. The first yard I go to, I see a homie get his neck split with the shank. Yard recall. They leave us on lockdown for a couple of months, then it would happen again. Then we started programming, going to yard and going to school, and out of nowhere, a vicious prison riot erupts. You know, um, I didn't really think I was gonna get accepted to this type of institution, and once I got the letter, it just, you know, it was truly tears. Um, I broke down, and yeah, I didn't think I was gonna actually make it. You know, it was it, it was a long journey, and you know, I was truly I didn't expect it to come even live this long. You know, most of us don't even expect it to be live, live this long. You know, we just like we say, either we just end up in a box in jail or dead, and it just you know, that's kind of where we usually just geared towards. But you know, this new path it was all different, and once I came here, it just this is where. Everything started coming together, and you know, coming here has it's been it's been a different experience. You know, um, we used to the fast life, and it's been a culture shock. But since I got here, it's been a beautiful experience, um, learning such experiences. And before I even came here, right before, right when I committed, you know, I had a spontaneous moment, and I switched my major from sociology to Chicano Chicana studies. And from there, it just it's been. I've been loving my courses. I've been. I have found a, my voice. I have found a sense of identity. It's time to come together as one. It's time to be one force against this oppressive state they call the Department of Corruption.
2.37 billion people do not have access to adequate food in 2020, an increase of almost 320 million people in just one year. Hunger is intolerable. So when we study world hunger, we're asking fundamental questions about our species and how we have organized our social existence. Was there, did I see a hand up over here? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I kind of find interesting within the with the famine is more like how it could be like the social construct of creating famine, like how one nation could actually construct famine. For example, how the U.S. during the 1990s with the Iraq, um, how they sanctioned Iraq's oil, that way you don't have to make certain income because when they make this income, um, they they able to buy resources from other countries. So what I'm trying to say is that how the parallels of the U.S. is more like like as gangs, like within the gang, like you actually try to cut off other gangs, um, you know, resources or the illicit market to make those incomes to leave them in and deprive them from like a social upward mobility. Yeah. So you're raising a really good and big issue, and I'm gonna I'm gonna break that down, right, for for the for the whole class, in which the point you're raising is actually linking the two themes that we're covering tonight. One is world's hunger, right, food and hunger, and the other theme is global police state. And they, in fact, are connected. And an excellent way to see how they are connected is the case you're mentioning of Iraq. My, my past says, history-wise, I shouldn't be here, if that makes sense. You know, I come from major drug addiction. I come from jails. I come from rehabs. So in my mind and from what I've seen being at a UC campus, this is just totally different um, from anything that I've done and anything that I've seen anybody else do. Um, so being able to have a community like Underground Scholars and make me feel, to help me feel like I do actually belong here has been amazing. My students who have dealt with the system of mass incarceration uh, dealt with head-on with uh, global police state or the ones that are become the most rapidly the most clear understanding of the society in which we live the oppressive and exploitative nature you know of, of these societies I think can, can not imagine a more important initiative than underground scholars and for two reasons one is that you it's um, giving its a structure and it's an organization which is welcoming people that have been incarcerated uh, into higher education uh, and to the opportunity for full empowerment and integration into this, you know, into the society we live in. But secondly, again, you know, the formerly incarcerated, as uh, Oscar already said, is, is the, you know, the epitome of those that are exploited, marginalized, locked out, and repressed in U.S. society, and for that matter, in global society. And uh, so what, what do you feel is our best route moving forward to really solidify this space and really enhance political agency and, and, and really bring each other together? Because one thing that I recognize about this space is that it's very toxic, too, you know, and, 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 and we've been divided, and then we're used as poster children. Yes. And we're right. used as a token, and they, they, they use us for funding and, you know, and stuff like that. So what do you feel is the best Well, well what you're doing, I mean, to have these projects outside of the university, right. which is where the real struggle is, right? This is part of the struggle, right? Or to, to gain knowledge about, formal knowledge about the world, to study the world, to have the space to do that. But the real struggle is outside of the university. And you're doing it with the credible messenger program, with what you're doing in the communities. So you know that's urgent, and what you what you're already doing, the inside outside on campus and outside in in the communities. Uh, where I come from, Santa Maria Evans Park project. Um, it's been most of my identity. Um, where I'm at in my journey today. Um, you know, I, I spent over a decade in recovery and uh, moved away from that identity that I had being from the projects, right? And uh, I've always had a, a heart for my peers because I've done a lot of time with beautiful people, amazing people, and, and it's, it's always broken my heart to know that they're going to spend, you know, the rest of their lives in prison. Um, 
And so I've gotten this opportunity to, to be a part of this, this thing that's growing in California now where we're, we're bringing our people into education, right? And, and we are allowing them to, to move into new spaces. And, uh, and I'm really grateful for that. You know, but I'm uh, I'm in this place right now where I'm in a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm I'm starting my uh, third year um, in a bachelor's program, uh, so I'm transitioning between schools from a community college to a bachelor's program, and uh, and I've got a lot of responsibilities, you know, with, with rising scholars and, and a lot of the things that I'm involved with, along with family and. Mm -hmm. and so there's this fear that I'm going to fail. There's this fear that I'm going to fall short. There's this fear that I'm not enough and, 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 and I'm going to hurt somebody in my life. Yeah. And uh, because that's what I do, right? I get angry, I fall short, I get frustrated, and I hurt people. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's, you know, and, and I share that because I, I, I honestly believe that this is a not a unique experience, right? Yeah. Like, so uh, I share that so that whoever might be experiencing that knows that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. My name is Herbert Gomez, Herbert Anibal Gomez. Uh, I was born in Guatemala. I was right here when I was nine years old. I got caught up in the neighborhood. I'm right here from Santa Barbara. I was got involved in the gangs. I was part of Ortega Park gang. They called me oldies. Um, by the time I was 16, I became an addict. Um, by the time I, I was 18, I served two, two prison terms. When I, when I turned 28, I got sentenced under the three strike law, got 36 to life, um, served 26 years, got out last year, and um, decided that, well, nine years ago, I said uh, I have to change my life because it was just going horrible. So um, I, st I stopped using, I got out, I wanted to help. Um, I joined school. I'm currently going to school for uh, drug and alcohol. Um, and uh, with, with, with the goal of, of getting my human services uh, degree, um, this is my second year, uh, you know, I wanted to prove to the world that I'm worth something. I, I was tired again, and being a, getting tired, and I was like, I want something in my life. I want something, I, I don't know where to go, but I, I you know, was on my hands and knees and I asked God, I said, please show me. Well, now look at me, you know, I'm a, um, this will be my fourth year already. I'll be graduating in the spring. I am a leading by example. I am here for my kids. My kids are following my footsteps. My little boy that I'm waiting for a call, um, like they look up to their parents, you know, like they don't, they saw all that, that, you know, my, my, they, they saw me on drugs, doing doing the most and now they're seeing me do the most in education. And The biggest part of it is it's us. It's us, the formerly incarcerated, the system impacted. It's it's us coming together as one and, and building it for ourselves because they didn't ever build none of this for us. They didn't have no resources, no programs dedicated to us. But now we're here and we're saying we're here to stay. <clears throat> And we're setting up this space and we're giving the hand up to each other. And that hand up is bringing up more organic leaders who are going out and healing their communities. And that's what it's going to be about. If we're, if we're really going to dismantle this system that's in place, it's got to be all of us coming together, linking together and sticking together and uplifting our communities. Uh, today we are coming together in solidarity among street organizations of Los Angeles. Uh, this is a peace conference talking about peace and, and bringing peace to the streets. Um, this is a, a part of the prison to university pipeline that we're establishing and building and a way to uh, uh, come together in our communities with solidarity and show our communities that we're together as well. Alright everyone, uh, with that being said, I'm Flaco from South San Montebello. Mucho gusto. Good to see everyone today. Uh, I'm down here from Santa Barbara. A little bit of my history. Uh, I, I was in the 2011-2013 Prisoner Hunger Strike. Starved myself for 33 days in New Folsom State Prison. Um, and after that, they gave us college courses. I signed up for college and uh, I started nah, nah, I started, I started studying, homie. I didn't know how to write with periods of commas. I didn't know how to fucking do my time tables. I didn't know any of that shit. But I sat in my cell on lockdown most of the time, fucking learning that shit and teaching that shit to myself. And uh, the gangster nerd clique, we all G's chasing degrees. 
You know what I'm saying? And we got the 4.0 gang members. These all, all these guys right here get 4.0s. You know what I'm saying? But we, we from the same barrios that you all are from, you know? And now we're here in solidarity. So I want everyone to line up over here. Come on, everyone. Shake it up. Come on, Estamos listos. This is about respect.
And the reality is there are always going to be conflict, but the representatives that are on play got a responsibility to hold their homeboys accountable and deal with these issues. Now, we want at least one homie from each barrio to go to college and, 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 and get a degree and come back and run for local government so we can put our, our homies in strategic positions in every barrio. So that's the ultimate objective is establishing ourselves in the community. And this, this collective is, 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 is hopefully going to provide the resources for the homies uh, to, to get jobs, to start businesses, and so on and so forth. So for now, for everybody who participated, uh, thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you. All right. All right, fellas. Access to the professor, it's kind of like this faceless entity. Once you go into those sections that a lot of times are going to be hosted in these buildings down here, you're going to be put into a smaller group where you get to go over that coaching materials. With, uh, so they teach you how to do the writing, how to be critically analysis around your whole critiquing of your research. But the best opportunity about it, they even pay for your um, your exams before you start applying for graduate graduate programs. But the whole thing about the McNeil program is that it gives you the, with the opportunity is to actually how can you conduct your research in an activism way. It's just these two buildings, South Hall and North Hall, and um, and Central are basically the the three most important buildings from the, the whole UCSB in, in my eyes because of the rich history and the rich activism and, and all the, and the activism individuals that have come through these, through these halls. This guy, him, is Maida La Rocha. He is one of the founding fathers of Chicano Chicano Studies Department to this day. I am one of the, this year, I am one of the first recipients of his scholarship that was implemented this year. And I'm one of the recipients. So I just want to thank you guys. You know, this guy, when you guys come by him, just the richness of the history of, of solidarity, it just speaks so much in itself of how far we have come for. And the last time when I was incarcerated, there was one individual, he was already doing his third, that he was going to do his third strike. And, and that's um, when I was in there. And he heard, he, heard me, he heard me spoke, and I told him about like, um, like the history of the Inquisitions, or like even like the history of like um, like how gangs were stemmed from colonization, and through um, like certain certain level of capitalism. But I wasn't fully developed consciously about capitalism. But I knew like gang banging would stem from like colonization. And this individual looked at me like, "You really like, what are you doing here? Like, you shouldn't be here. You know what I mean? Like." And he thought like literally he thought like I was like like 25 years old, 26 years old, and I want to highlight that I was only like 18, like 19, and it, and it became to the point where like, man, like you really you know your stuff, like why are you doing here? Like you should you should change the the whole stereotypes around us, since knowing that you are a validated gang member, being a validated gang member will give you a lot more um, voice within certain particular um, political realms within the, like in the civil society if you really want to push policy. But yeah, so you find people that support you like internally than externally. But my closest friends right now, they're, they're very proud of me. About two and a half years ago, I came on a tour here. And my first question was, where are the people like me at? Um, UCSB had nothing. And so the first thing I did was scratch them off my list. Um, about six months later, I got a call from Gilbert Murillo and Ryan Rising telling me that they're formally incarcerated, they're gonna start something here at UCSB. And we made a connection. And uh, so I'm at Allen Hancock College, the co-founder of the Biggie Club, Beyond Incarceration, Greater Education. And uh, I was trying to reinvent the wheel. And when I seen, when I talked to Flacco and to, to Shadow, and I seen that there's people just like me that have been in my shoes that are at the UC level. I'm like, man, how'd you guys get there, right? That was my first question. How'd you guys get there? What do I have to do to get there? And uh, I didn't, never thought I, I'd be uh, coming to a UC, but after the next tour I took here at UCSB and I met some individuals that were chasing their doctorate that were formerly incarcerated, I said, shit, Dr. Regosa sounds pretty good. Um, so that's, that's been part of my goals right now. I'm going to chase my doctorate, right? Um, that's right.
my mom always said, you're going to be just like your fucking dad. You ain't going to amount to shit, you know. Be it that in 2015, my mom my mom passed away, right, before I went to college. Um, she's in the hospital. She's waiting to go into surgery. I'm in the parking lot hitting the pipa, and, and uh, they're waiting for me to get there, right? I, I'm getting high. I'm, I'm getting my mind right. When I go in, um, they're already, uh, she's on their gurney, and they're wheeling her away. Um, she stops him. She looks at me, and she says, Chito, I'm sorry. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, I love you. And uh, she never came out of surgery. That was, that was my last conversation with my mom, right? So when I got, we got to college, you know, she never seen that. Um, you know, the college has opened me up to a whole new world I never knew existed. Um, before COVID, I was going to Los Piratos Boys Camp and talking to these boys, man, because I was there. And, um, and I tell them, I go like, if you want to learn how to roll up your mattress and do burpees at five in the morning, I could show you that. I go, if you want to learn how to get a higher education, a new way of life, I could show you that too. The choice is yours, right? Where you from? Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara? Where are you at? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Okay. I go to San Marcos High School and I'm in 10th grade. My name is Active Alex, Alex and I, li I was born here in SB and I'm in 10th grade. Um, my last prison term, um, I had my, my daughter, um, uh, Sunshine was uh, a year and a half and instead of being a father and being there for uh, sunshine i was out in the streets i was robbing people and stealing and getting high on drugs and um i ended up incarcerated and my son was born two months after i got incarcerated and so i was in prison for the first part of my son's life for the first seven years of his life he never got to meet his dad he never got to see me. He never got to hold me. He never, I never got to hold him for the first seven years of his life. And I, I feel a lot of guilt for that, you know? You know, obviously when I turned 18, um, um, the system just kicked me out. They're like, you know, you're a grown man, you're 18, you get out. And I didn't truly figure out how much of an impact not having a family was gonna be. Mm -hmm. um, I had nowhere to go. I didn't know, you know, I had the homies, and I had the hood there, but it was, it was different. Because I couldn't call anybody, mom, dad, be like, hey, help me out. I couldn't do any of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where to go. You know, and then, um, and that's when I started realizing that the, the homies that I call homies weren't with the, really the homies. Because when I really needed them the most to have a, a, a bed, some food on the plate, they weren't there. And that's when I started realizing, I'm like, what is this work that I'm doing for? What is all of this that I'm doing for what? It wasn't work. And that's when I realized of how big of an impact not having a family was. So when we're able to show these kids that, um, we're able to basically show them, like, you're not doing anything different, and you're not going through anything different that we haven't been through. The only difference is that we have already seen the dead end at the end of the road, you still haven't made that turn so you don't realize what the ultimate end is for your behavior, you know? And I think for us, when we're speaking to the kids, we let them know that at the end of the day, you're gonna end up paying the price. And we just wanna make sure that when you are sitting in that cell, that you don't say, nobody told me. So that way you can be at peace, that you made those choices, you take more accountability, and that way it also makes the kid be more aware of saying, you know what, I know where I want to end up, so let me take a step back and calculate a plan there instead of just living day by day by day. You have siblings, right? Yeah. What would be the worst thing? What would be went down my path? Yeah, you did the same thing I'm doing right now, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and and that's for me like I kind of see it with them when, when you're talking about like failing. It's like you're failing, but at the same time you're empowering the same system that 
displays these stereotypes on you to reinforce these stereotypes mm -hmm. and you become that same number and that same statistics underneath this um this colonial white supremacy structure and it, it's like you know you don't want to be that individual to be failing you always want to be that that next individual to create something for self-healing for the next generation I, i'm just here and i am most afraid in myself or others well, I'm almost afraid of like losing my baby brother and my brother. Brother shit I do. My name is Active Alex and I'm most afraid of losing my family. Unfortunately, we're so oppressed, we're so pushed down to where we don't feel like we're in a place to speak up for ourselves, to speak up for the next person. Um, and so we just let things slide. We let it slide, we let it slide. And to the point where when we look around, we don't have nothing and everything's stacked against us, right? So it's up to us to, to speak up for ourselves. Find your group. Not even close yet. Find your group. Not yet. Find your group. You're good. That's your group. <laughs> what you learn about that that jewelry piece on your ankle? Oh, well, to not hide this again. The action for the consequences? Yeah. So, not do more than best do. Or hurt more people. Okay. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Jumper! Oh, shit! serious you know what I'm saying and just do well my boy like you don't have to prove yourself to nobody well, let me tell you something to this past two days you showed this whole community how much of an amazing leader you are so you don't need to go prove yourself to any of the homies you don't need to go out in the streets and, and do anything that's gonna jeopardize your life and jeopardize your mom and, 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 and your family having to deal with some sort of decision that you make so let's push past it this time and, and look at me, boy, in the eyes and just know that you're an amazing leader, bro. And that yeah. you're, you're, you, you have a special place in this community, homie. And I can't wait to see you graduate. So let's go get this high school diploma and then let's get you over to UCSB so you can come kick it with us. Cool? For sure. All right, my boy. Good job, yeah. homie. I'm proud of you, all right? Yeah. Here, let's get a picture real quick. One, two, three. Hey, Hey. That's right.